Good afternoon. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to our Thought Leaders series, Innovation in Rail. My name is Amanda Rogers and I will be your host for today. Firstly, in keeping with our tradition, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that today's webinar has been hosted with our industry partner, Geofabrics. Geofabrics is Australasia's geosynthesis specialist. They help their clients deliver and maintain their infrastructure by minimising risk and increasing value through the innovative use of geosynthetic products. For over 35 years, they have supported the Australasian infrastructure sector on significant projects from the Victoria level crossing removal to APLNG in Queensland to the Christchurch gondola in New Zealand. On these projects and every project Geofabrics undertake, they have a singular focus to provide smarter infrastructure solutions for their clients. I now like to welcome our first speaker for today, Mark Dreschler. Mark joins as a technical principal engineering geologist with SMEC. Mark has over 38 years as an engineering geologist involved in investigation, design and construction of mining, civil and transport infrastructure projects throughout Australia and Papua New Guinea. Mark's specialist areas include geotechnical investigations, earthwork specifications, construction materials, rail and road pavements, quarry development and geopolymer concrete technology. Mark is a subject matter expert geotechnical for the iconic 1,700-kilometre long inland rail project and co-authored ARTC's updated earthworks <coughs> and construction specifications. Please welcome Mark Dreschler. Thanks, Amanda, for that introduction. I would like to talk about the Inland Rail project and earthworks and the innovative work we've done uh, for that project to ensure value for money for the project. I'd like to acknowledge uh, country. Uh, we acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional custodians of the land in which we work. We pay our respects to the elders of the past present and future and acknowledge their spiritual connection to this country. Uh, this is an outline of my presentation and I, uh, I will briefly talk about the Inland Rail program itself, give a bit of a background on that, then talk about some of the geotechnical challenges that we've had, um, then the development of the specifications that we undertook uh, during the project and then some industry opportunities and challenges. And I'd like to um, thank um, the co-authors, the, uh, the team that uh, helped um, put together this project, uh, this presentation. It's been um, nearly five years in the making. So myself and Dr. Richard Kelly uh, from SMEC, Tim Neville from ARTC, from the Hunter Valley area, Andrew Newson and Sam Sawtell, both TA engineers. I'd also like to acknowledge that the work was completed as part of the technical advisor role by the SMEC Arab Joint Venture, uh, who are engaged by Inland Rail. So what is the Inland Rail program? It's about connecting Melbourne to Brisbane with a fast and reliable freight backbone, which goes through regional Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland. At the moment, freight goes through Sydney and that is a, a large bottleneck. And so the program that was developed or started at, over 10 years ago looked at alternative routes um, to um, ensure a faster um, a transiting of a freight. And what was developed over many years and many options and which finally came came was a 1700 kilometer route um, involving both brownfield and greenfield rail development that went through victoria uh, new south wales up through queensland 
Where possible, the alignment used the existing rail network, and this is Brownfield's um, developments. But also, the project also identified there was several gaps in that in that network, and so these are the greenfield developments. And so overall, it was. Uh, it is designed to allow a double stacked 1800 metre long freight train to travel from Melbourne to Brisbane in 24 hours. The brownfield developments, a lot of it was about ensuring uh, clearances for the, for the double stacked trains, but also for the larger, larger uh, trains. Whereas the greenfield development was new alignments. So the project is divided up into 13 different projects, given the, the length of the alignment. These 13 uh, different projects um, uh, are all being designed and delivered um, by different uh, procurement methods. And some of them are quite small, specific areas, whereas other, others are quite large. And again, like just um, Talk about the, the SMEC Arab joint venture. We were appointed as the technical advisor in early 2016 to work collaboratively with the ARTC. And that's uh, providing them with uh, technical advice during the design, planning, and delivery phases of all these works. Obviously, for a large project like this, there's a large uh, team needed. And so, ARTC uh, uses the technical advisor to provide those technical expertise that they themselves don't have. So given the 1,700 kilometres of alignment, you would expect that the ground conditions and um, would, would change dramatically, and so it does. I think at last count, there's probably over 20 million cubes of cut and 20 million cubes of fill along the alignment. And that's pr and, um, so they're very large volumes just themselves. Those cut and fills are not balanced along the alignment. There's large areas of cut and there's large areas of fill. And so there's a lot of mass haulage in between those cut and fills. On top of the earthworks, there'll be uh, 8 million tonnes of ballast capping and also road, road materials for the, uh, the rail maintenance access road, plus also the associated road works that we need to be done. Along the alignment, there's over 400 kilometres of highly reactive soils. These are black soils. Um, there's also extensive floodplains and watercourses. And along the alignment, there's cut and, and fill embankments that could be up to 25 metres uh, in height. And we've also got three tunnels, of which uh, one is a 6.5 kilometre long tunnel that goes underneath the Toowoomba Ranges. So there's a very challenging geotechnical and geological conditions. Also for uh, infrastructure uh, uh, con construction, there's a massive shortage of earthworks materials. And obviously, there's the alignment goes through three states. And each state has got different uh, specifications for their construction materials and, and earthworks. And uh, believe me, um, the laws of physics change at uh, borders, even though they shouldn't. And so one of the challenges for inland rail cr crossing three jurisdictions is to have the same specifications all the way through. So these are some of the geotechnical challenges, dispersive soils, some of the, the old, uh, the existing rail um, network has got, a bit, has been constructed using um, fly ash materials and other materials that, that we wouldn't use today. There's water courses and below. Um, the figure below is the uh, black soil. Some of these are quite deep, up to two or three metres deep of black soils. And when they get wet, they're very problematic. So out at the start of the Inland Rail program, we, were, we looked at the ARTC existing specifications and we, and we found that they were very prescriptive specifications. And due to the the large nature of the pro of the program, we decided that we needed performance-based specifications, which would then allow us to achieve value engineering solutions along the whole, whole alignment. So we revised the materials and construction specifications to allow us to get flexibility to meet all those geotechnical challenges that we would find along that 700 kilometre route. 
to help us with that, we also engaged um, with the ARTC business and we learned from their existing network, including the Hunter Valley Heavy Hall network. ARTC themselves haven't constructed large projects like this in the past. So, um, so we uh, sought their assistance in their, um, in their possession a construction methodology to ensure that that was a, a consistent as well. We also incorporated the best industry practice and we looked at alternative testing methods. And we wanted to ensure that the specification supported value engineering outcomes because we wanted to ensure value for money for the project. And we wanted to ensure that these specifications use modern geotechnical principles and modeling. As a lot of the specifications have been around for 50 years or more. Also, the specifications are required to re reduce contractual disputes and to ensure that latent conditions aren't uh, um, encountered. So developing the specifications for inland rail was a, a, a four-year process. Started in 2016, where we identified the need for the specifications. We developed the Earthworks material specification, ETC 0803, um, as, as, the first, as the first step. Because we were starting to do some of the geotechnical investigations for the program, so those material specs needed to be identified. We then worked on the construction specification, which, which incorporated the requirements of the material spec in uh, later on. And then by the end of November 2017, we had we had developed both, and so they were integral. And then we then updated the material spec uh, in December 2019, based on feedback and uh, from the industry, from the from the projects that were in delivery. And so we're now moving forward. So basically, ETC 0803 and ETC 0804 have replaced um, several. Um, standards within the ARTC network. So we wanted the material specification to, to present deemed to comply requirements, but we also want them to be able to be varied uh, so that the, the designers can use the available materials along the alignment, because we knew of the variability across the whole alignment. We provided min minimum requirements for the capping, structural, general fill, and the select fills that were consistent across the borders, and, and so that the the designers and the contractors, no matter where they are along the alignment, had consistent requirements. We also provided uh, provisions for in situ or plant stabilisation of locally one material, so that we can support uh, the project specifications. We included improved um, classification of unsuitable materials. We allowed for the use of geosynthetics. We allowed for zone embankments. Um, and we also directly linked the specification to the project quality plans and construction compliance requirements. And also at the end of the project, we need to hand over this information. So the specifications were linked to those handover requirements to ARTC. So the specifications allow for variability of testing and alternative testing methods, because if the designer finds that the materials that they along the alignment don't match exactly the specification, they can alter the design to match the materials. And that is one of the major impacts of the specifications is to maximise the use of local materials. We also know that the climatic conditions change on along 1700 kilometres and so the soaking days of CBR testing can be varied. Also the extensive black soils and low, and low strength materials, we wanted to reduce the importation of scarce quarried and borrowed materials by improving those materials and the specification allows that. We had improved durability and performance testing conditions of all of the engineered materials to the latest Australian standards. We included learnings from the AATC uh, corridor by including a permeability criteria for capping and higher durability select fill adjacent to bridges and, and culverts. 
And we also included linkage to the environmental and sustainability requirements for the project with the earthworks material management framework, which links to the environmental requirements. This is a zoned embankment and so allows the upper zones and the outer zones to, to have the more durable materials while in the core, the, the more reactive, lower strength um, materials that are uh, highly susceptible to erosion and, and durability issues are protected in the core, are placed and protected in the core. So we've got a whole range of materials. But obviously, because of the materials along the alignment, we, the, the, the designer can amend those as well. <clears throat> One of the important aspects is we uh, the specifications um, include the use of geosynthetics within the earthworks, and it provides a consistent um, um, performance requirement for the geosynthetics. Uh, and use in their earthworks. One of the important factors, uh, one of the important clauses in the specification, and it's based on the ARTC uh, network um, experience, is that the geogrids and geotextiles shall not be placed closer than 400 mil from the from below the formation level. In other words, the top of the capping, where there is the potential for rail rail bound formation renewal to be used. In other words, where they have the big uh, train, uh, track mounted um, reconditioning uh, equipment, uh, they don't want to encounter geotextiles um, or geogrids within that area. Obviously, stations and turnouts and other track areas, uh, they can be used, but also they also can be used elsewhere. They just need to be nominated to make sure that the maintenance people know where they are. Another important aspect is the geosynthetics uh, nominated uh, performance uh, uh, based on nominated performance. They're not speci specific to products or suppliers. Inland rail needs to be agnostic. So the geosynthetics, um, um, the geotextiles are based on strength class and filtration. So these are the types of criteria, all with Australian standard uh, requirements and clearly de delineated. And these are the filtration, so strength and filtration. The geogrids, we identified that the industry had, and the market has several uh, products. And so we wanted to ensure that all those products are potentially used within the project. So we developed the geogrid class applications, uh, five classes to allow for uniaxial, biaxial and multiaxial uh, geogrid products. And then the, the, um, the area in which those different products could potentially be used within the earthworks, including the ballast. So these are the class applications. So this is for the uniaxial and biaxial. And these are the multi-actual grid classifications. These are all industry standard requirements, but they combine all these into a single specification to make it easier for the designers and the contractors to use. As I said, we wanted to ensure that the specification supports inland rails drive for maximizing the use of site one materials and minimizing the use of imported materials. And part of that is meeting environmental criteria. And so the Earthworks Materials Management Framework uh, at, the end, at the end of the specification asked the question about uh, have alternative materials been, um, can, been considered, but also their in environmental uh, classification um, and their potential use both within the, in the corridor, but also disposal outside the corridor. So this links all the environmental and the contamination legislative criteria uh, for all three states into the earthworks specification. Finally, we talk about the earthworks construction specification. So that uses the materials in the earthworks 
material specification during construction. So it is in fully integrated. We also provided different construction methodologies and extensive compliance testing um, methodologies. We also have foundation treatments in those in the specification. And we allowed for both compacted layer and method compaction methods to be used. There's extensive hold points and witness points to help administer the contract. And there's also construction requirements for uh, trial sections and developing project specific specifications for stabilization and other um, uh, testing methods. So how does, that, how does it all impact the project? As you can see on the pie chart, earthworks, the bulk earthworks and the formation on average accounts for around about 30% of the direct capital costs of inland rail. Obviously these percentages are range uh, for, from project to project, but overall, so about a third of the capital cost is based on earthworks. So inland rail is about looking at seeking value engineering opportunities to reduce those capital costs, reduce operating costs and reducing its environmental footprint. But obviously AATC must not um, uh, change its requirement for maintaining safety and maintaining, maintaining its desired performance. So given all that, there is, and given the large proportion of the uh, capital costs is is in bulk earthworks and formation, any small improvements in formation, bulk earthworks, and even the structures and culverts associated with those can and will save inland rail hundreds of millions of dollars. This is just a quick uh, diagram. It's quite complex, but it shows some of the design assumptions that influence the earthworks costs. If we start from the left, the track design, what the axle loads and the train configuration, the sleeper and the ballast and all those things. And then we go down and how those loads are in, uh, transform and interact with the underlying formation, that's the capping, and then down into the structural fill layer. And then finally those loads that then go into the earthworks, the, the bulk earthworks design. So if we go onto the right side, we look at how those loads are impacted and imparted into the general fill and the subgrade. And then as part of the design, how are all those different layers um, uh, performing with those loads? Also, there's not only the loads from the train, there's also many external factors for the earthworks design. And you'll see that the earthworks design is driven by the horizontal and vertical alignments, the flood immunity, cut and fill balance, where culverts are, bridges, and a whole range of other issues that all need to be considered as part of the earthworks design. Each one of those elements has a cost estimate uh, element and a risk element, which Inland Rail needs to consider. So what are the, Inland Rail is a unique opportunity. Um, it is. 1,700 kilometres of Australian terrain, and it is a, a real world laboratory. And Inland Rail actually encourages um, um, innovation uh, by its designers and, con and contractors. But here are some few uh, observations and ideas. Because we're covering 1,700 kilometres and there's 13 different projects, each of those projects have got different designers and, and contractors, there's always different design assumptions uh, from each of those projects. And so there's, there's some inconsistency. So part of the TA's role is to ensure consistency across all the projects, the design inputs and the uh, design methodologies used in rail. Because the large earthworks volumes, there's opportunities for instrumentation and uh, redefining the earthworks based on the design assumptions. There's large areas of flood levels and those durations, and they impact uh, the, the earthworks. Also, we would like to look at you know, the balance of using geosynthetics to reduce the earthworks cost because of the lack of earthworks materials along the project. 
our early works have been engaged in some areas where we have undertaken lime stabilisation because of the lack of materials. And it's, it, would, it would be great for the industry to undertake long-term performance of those lime stabilisation earthworks to ensure that the performance requirements assumed in the design um, occur over the design life. I suppose we also want to ensure that uh, the projects are using sustainability and reusing waste materials as much as much as possible. I also like to consider where we can um, innovate and use construction uh, different con construction compaction controls to eliminate uh, extensive laboratory testing. We also like to link the projects. You know, into information systems, and so that the maintenance and the long and the and the owner, the asset owner, ARTC, has that information for the long term. So, in summary, ARTC found that prescriptive earthwork specifications are most suitable for their small projects and maintenance occupations, and that's because they they require tried and tested solutions you know, for their construction teams, especially in possessions. However, long Large projects like inland rail, which covers 1,700 kilometres with large earthworks volumes, a performance-based earthwork, earthwork specification provides much more um, value engineering opportunities where designers can optimise the earthworks to meet the challenging geological and geotechnical conditions. A major rail project such as inland rail, which covers several jurisdictions can be the, the vehicle for development of best practice performance earthwork specifications. So we can lead the way. So AOTC has developed performance-based specifications, ETC 0803 for earthworks materials and ETC 0804 for earthworks construction to allow greater use of site one materials from the rail corridor. We've done that because we are, we know that track, the track formation, the bulk earthworks, can comprise around a third of the inland rail capital costs. And any improvements that the specifications can facilitate will provide significant cost savings to inland rail. And inland rail is being financed by the federal government, so all taxpayers will have cost savings. So Inland Rail seeks the designers and contractors to rise to that challenge to, so that they can, so the Inland Rail can actually realise those cost savings. And it's been interesting as the technical advisor is to try and challenge those designers to get out of less, to get out of more conservative designs and to be less conservative in their designs. And finally, there's the opportunity for some targeted rail research to look at the long-term performance benefits of the, de the design assumptions and the specifications that we've developed in the earthworks and the formation design and to ensure that the design life of the project is met. And I'd like to thank the Inland Rail Project for this unique opportunity to work on a large project over a wide variety of conditions with a fantastic team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for your insights. I'd now like to welcome our second speaker, Rajesh Fasal. Rajesh is leading the team of business development infrastructure sector for Geofabrics Australia. Rajesh holds a Bachelor of Engineering degree in Civil Engineering and has over 29 years of design and construction experience with over 14 years in business development and technical marketing of geosynthetic materials in Australia. Rajesh joined Geofabrics in early 2007, worked in design section before moving into a business development position. During his 14 years of tenure at Geofabrics, he has been extensively involved in assisting geotechnical consultancies throughout Australia by offering preliminary evaluations on road, rail, vertical structures, high embankments, ports and airports using different geosynthetic products. 
So currently a member of um, Ange Australia, member of AGS and ACIGS, an Australian chapter of International Geosynthetic Society. Please welcome Rajesh Asar. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, Amanda, uh, thanks for a great introduction. Um, my name is Rajesh Bowser. I'm working as a National Business Development Manager of Infrastructure Sector for Geofabrics. And I'm here to talk about using some geosynthetic materials in a rail solutions and what innovations has been done in the last 30 years in rail industries. And so my presentation outline covers rail solutions, a case studies, a sustainable product range, other products and applications in rail, and a bit of summary on the geosynthetic usage in, in Australia. So first of all, let me talk about the rail solutions. So we as a Geofabrics has been involved in rail industries since 1991 here in Australia. And our involvement covers wide range of applications, including capping layers, so stabilizing capping layers with geogrids and uh, geocells and other geosynthetic materials. We are also involved in ballast stabilizations. We recently introduced anti-mud pumping geocomposites, a uh, number of projects of level crossings, turnouts, breach approach slabs for controlling the differential settlements. Oh, we are also looking after looking for some other options using ballast take mats, subsoil drainage, which is our mega flow we manufacture here in Australia. Rockford drapery system, I should say, irrigation control products and concrete canvas. Now, first of all, I will give you some understanding of mechanically stabilized rail track pads, which is in a capping. So if you consider capping layer and current design on certain subgrade condition, we know that uh, uh, design guidelines actually requested to place around 0.5 to 1 meter thick structural fill on a very soft subgrade. On top of that one, we have a capping layer, certain thickness of the ballast and rail. Now, when we introduce a layer of geosynthetics in this structural and capping layer, our main function is increasing bearing capacity without compromising with the performance. And it also allows us to reduce the capping layer depth and imported fill material. And that's where our main focus of utilizing geosynthetic materials. So what, in a one line, I can say that we are trying to optimize the thickness of these structural fill and capping layers without compromising with the design life by introducing one or more layers of geosynthetic materials in these sections. So. What I would like to do is I will go back into the history first, and then I will give you some more innovative ideas and understanding. So this is actually one of the earliest projects Geofabrics has been involved, which was constructed in 1996. So this is one of the old known geograde applications in Australia. It's actually on a main line between Brisbane to Cairns, and it passes through the Rockhampton down the center of Denison Street. This section was actually constructed in 1996. And at that particular time, a design team uh, actually adopted reducing the depth of the capping from 600 millimeter to 400 millimeter. The main reason was de behind doing this one was if they adopt a conventional design of using 600 millimeter of capping, there was a huge cost of relocating number of services. And at the same time, by adding a layer of geogrids, they were able to reduce the thickness from 600 millimeter to 400 millimeter. So just giving you some, or showing you some good photos of that projects, early photos, I should say, in terms of construction. And you can see construction photos is actually virtually a big bathtub. So they used a mega flow. Make, make 300 on both the sides of the construction sections. And they have used one layer of medium geotextile as a separators. And on top of that one, they have a tensile geogrids with a structural fill as well as capping over the top. And this is the finished photos. Not sure you can see a nice 
uh, car yard there. So just focus on that particular car yard because it's our one of the uh, main point for the comparisons of the design section. So, and this is the photos taken in April 2016. So you can see one more time that car yard is still there, which is great. And you can see from this particular photos, there was no distress at all on the surface and there was no maintenance required at that particular time. So you can see nearly 20 years of life using geosynthetics without compromising with the design love, which allowed the reduction in the pavement thickness. Now, what I would like to do is I would like to bring this one into certain design criteria. So now I'm taking the design approach, which is generally US or sometimes uh, some of the authorities and designers also consider that one here in Australian operation, uh, actually solving the Talbot equations for the bearing capacity. And this is very well established and well defined in Arema manual for the rail engineering in US. So yes, you can see this one, H equal to 16.8 multiplied by PA by PC, raised to 0.8. And PA is actually allowable pressure at the bottom of the sleeper, as you can see in the photos or in these particular slides. And PC is actually allowable stresses at the top of the subgrade. Now, where the geosynthetic comes into the equation, so when we add a layer of geogrades, the allowable stress at the top of the subgrade is influenced by this particular layer of geogrades. So now, what I would like to show you is how geosynthetics or geogrades can be now utilized in this design calculation. So what we have done is uh, we actually uh, come up with the Tensor actually come up, I should say, Tensor actually come up with this particular software called SpectraDL. And it's actually uh, have a two module. One is actually stabilization of capping and second one is stabilization of ballast. And we are purely focusing on the capping stabilization module. So we replicated the site conditions into this particular software at that particular time with the wheel load, uh, tie, which is the sleepers, the thickness of the ballast, and thickness of the capping. And in this particular case, we are comparing the performance of Tensor TX geogrids and Tensor Biaxial geogrid, which was actually used on this particular project in 1996. So if we consider the output of the capping, you can very clearly see that. If we design this particular section current, it may require only 254 millimeter of the capping with the biaxial geogrid, but you can see further if we utilize the TX160, it may require only 203 or 205 millimeter of payment or capping, I should say. So now you can see when we consider 400 millimeter of payment used or scaping layer used in that particular section, you can very easily see some additional factor of safety. safety has already been considered in that particular design. So now from that particular 1996 to 2016, you can see why that particular section is performing very well with the use of one layer of geogrids there. And it also allows the reduction in the paving thickness, which is a great saving for the client. Now, what I'd like to show you is further, I'm telling you, Tensar has taken this one to the further level by carrying out lots of triaxial testings on these particular geogrids with the different types of film material. So tensor geogrid used throughout the world to stabilize the capping layers. Same thing with the stabilizing the ballast layers. However, nowadays the main question arise is poor quality film materials. So as we know, all the rail authorities and some of the rail operators are facing the major issues of dispose of that poor quality film materials, which includes span ballast and span ballast and general mist mix, and how we can reutilize that particular film material into your capping with a layer of geogrids without compromising with the design lab. So this was the Film material of foul ballast gradation has been given to Geofabrics by one of the real authorities here in Australia. And Tensar actually replicated 
uh, the fill material, which you can see as a foul ballast in their laboratories to meet this particular certain gradation criteria. And there was a large scale trial shell testing has been done on this particular section or in this particular fill material with a geosynthetic. So you can see in this particular case, it's a foul ballast testing, three dimensions, sorry, tri shell test with a one meter high and half a meter diameter. And they, they need to put them some vacuum cell pressure and that cell pressure can go up to 80 kPa. Geograde was placed at the mid height and there are five radial strain gauges as you can see from this particular photo. And just give you a heads up, I have presented the paper at CO 2021 recently on this particular topic. So if you are interested, uh, I am happy to share my paper with you. Um, but let me present or compare uh, the outcome. You can see from this particular fall ballast testing, the first one is without geogrids. And you can see very easily here, the confining stress was actually went up to 350 kPa. But at the same time, you can see this particular unload reload preload group, I should say, to establish the clear modulus. Now, at the same time, with this particular stress versus uh, uh, confinement stress, you can see very easily that it's actually showing you a curvy linear relationship. And I will give you some more information on that one later on. So this is actually foul ballast test without geogrids. This is foul ballast test with one layer of tensile TX170. And you can very easily see here or see here that actually the confinement pressure went up to 450 kPa by inclusion of one layer of geogrids. And you can see very easily the without geogrid, it was 350 kPa with geogrids, it went up to 450 kPa. Now, if you consider a one layer of TX190L, that actually went up to 475 kPa. So actually, nearly 30 to 33 percent of in, a, in a additional strength has been introduced by adding a layer of geogrids. Now as you can see here we are talking about a performance of a tensile geogrids with the fill material so we are not considering any index properties of the geogrid here but just we are introducing a layer of geogrids and granular particles interlocking with each other and making this particular increase in strength happen. So in a summary, if I go back to here, in this particular case, you can see this particular one layer of tensor triaxial geogrid actually offering a very high shear strength from the stabilization effect. And that's actually not only that one, you can see it's actually also give the higher peak but also maintaining at the high strain. So you can see here it's generally creating or offering a greater ductility in this particular application. So now, what that means is if you consider that particular uh, linear, sorry, curvy linear relationship, uh, this is actually model on soil geogrid behavior established by TENSAR. And this TS, TSSM, which is TENSAR Stabilized Soil Module, is based on a very sound geotechnical principle. It also shows you curvy linear shear strength failure envelope of the stabilized soil. Now, let me show you some other works has been done utilizing the similar TSSM module. So this is outcome of uh, Plexi study where a capping uh, consider of CBR45 material without geogrid. So client was actually interested in measuring or seeing if they can replace CBR45 material with CBR25 and one layer of geogrid. So this is actually just a very good comparison of the vertical stress of both the sections. So which means when I said both the sections, I'm talking about CBR45 material with no geogrid and then CBR25 material with a one layer of geogrid. That is measured. So here a similar thing, capping CBR25 no geogrid. And third one is capping CBR25 with one layer of TX geogrid. So what the target was achieving the similar sort of vertical stress 
replicating the same gram conditions and loading conditions and measuring the performance of CBR45 material without GeoGrid and C uh, compared to CBR25 material with one layer of TX GeoGrid. So this is the result. So yes, you can see very clearly that based on the preliminary assessment, Insert's TSSM model for TX116 Plexis 2D indicates that the stress is constrained under the same loading conditions for low quality film material with GeoGrid is in close agreement with the higher quality film material. And you can see very clearly that horizontal and vertical stresses in both the sections are nearly equal, presenting the equivalencies in terms of the performance under the rail loading. So now, these particular types of testing, which is a triaxial testing, full-scale triaxial testing, and using some latest scientific models like a Plexis 2D, consultants, clients can utilize lower quality film material with a layer of geogrids without compromising with the design life of, the, of that particular capping layer. Now we have taken this one to the next level with a, one of the consultants who actually was interested in defining the service life of different geosynthetic solutions. So here on these particular projects, Geofabrics offered nearly five different treatment options and the consultant put in a, in a design calculations to see what would be the life expectancies of these different treatment options. And you can see that it varies from 20, two years of life to 90 years of life. And in some of the section is less than one point or one years of life too. So nowadays, the new softwares and new different types of treatment options using different geosynthetic materials also allows to define the life expectancies for the clients. And this actually design was on these different treatment options were adopted on one of the major projects in Australia. So now from capping, I'm focusing on the ballast stabilization, which is a similar sort of applications, but with a different target. So here in particular with the ballast stabilization, the principal function is the lateral confinement of the ballast, which generally result in preserving the vertical alignment or, and reduce the track maintenance. And Geofabrics has been involved in numerous projects throughout Australia to make it happen. One more time, I would like to show you some couple of projects here. This is actually ballast stabilizations uh, in UK at Kupul Moor in 2005. And you can see before 2005, there are numerous uh, maintenance cycle has been adopted. But in 2005, when a layer of GeoGrid was installed in this particular ballast layer, actually the maintenance interval was factored by eight. So in that particular case, they, they need to actually maintain this particular uh, ballast or tamping every six months. This went up to four years without any tamping. And that was a very good definition of how this geogrid can introduce and install properly as well as improve the design life. Now, what I would like to show you is a very smart invention recently done by Pennsylvania State University called a smart rock. And what that smart rock is nothing but replicating a one rock particles in 3D printed into the smart rock. Just I would like to show you a nice videos of this particular case where you can see without geogrids under a cyclic loading and with tensor TX1, 90L geogrid. So you can see in this particular case uh, where the interlocking mechanism with tensor triaxial geogrid didn't allow any movements in that particular ballast layer. But when you see without geogrid, that particular ballast particle was moving frequently and freely throughout the test. So just a very clear cut definitions of improvement in the performance. So here you can see the particle translational, translational moment, I should say. Without geogrids, you can see that particular ballast was moving everywhere, but you can see with the geogrids, it is a very 
thin and very sharp envelope where you can see a very good confinement effect happening with the geogrids. Uh, similarly, the rotational movement, and you can see the similar sort of outcome by using a triaxial geogrid. Now, this is also actually tested with a geoweb in a, in a similar facilities where they also measured the improvement of the ballast particles or performance of that particular uh, ballast layers by having a layer of geogrid, or sorry, geoweb, I should say. And actually, uh, this particular smart rock was added to the ballast layer at the halfway between the bottom of the type and geoweb, as well as along with the geoweb panels. And you can see nearly similar outcome that within a ballast, oh, sorry, I should say, without geoweb, you can see the movement of the ballast in all the three directions. But at the same time, with geoweb, it, the stabilization of ballast layer with the geoweb actually, actually significantly reduce the particle acceleration, as well as improve the performance of that particular ballast layer. Now. Third thing, which is very interesting scenarios we are looking at is a mud pumping. And it's a very common, but a very major concerns on a number of rail lines here in Australia. Because as we know is that once we have these mud pumping issues, it will create a lots of other concerns and problems and stability of this particular rail line. So actually, this is some nice photos of upward mobilization of the fine grade particles from the formation layer into the ballast layer under the cyclic conditions and a very high moisture issues. So what is the Tractex? So Tractex is actually developed by Geofabrics UK. It's a composite with a very, with a one layer of microporous filter sandwiched between two layers of non-woven geotextiles, as you can see from the photos. What it does, it prevents the percolation of the rainwater throughout the ballast layer into the capping from the top. At the same time, it dissipates the trapped water in the capping layer upwards through the microporous filter. So it's a impermeable permeable layer. When I said impermeable permeable, it doesn't allow water passing from the top, but it allows water only water passing through the microporous filter from the bottom, but won't allow any fine green or fine particles going up into the ballast layer. So it's creating an impermeable layer for the mud or for the fine particles, which generally compromise the performance of the ballast layer. So it, as I say, it prevents the mitigation of the fine grain clay particles, mud pumping into the ballast. So what are the benefits? So TrackFlex actually provides a solution to those sites which experience a repetitive mud pumping. It can be replaced directly on the expected surface following the undercutting. It can also be used as a protection layer, especially at the turnouts layer, level crossings, etc., where the maintenance is ex extremely expensive. It also protects the capping layer, and it can use with other geosynthetics to provide a complete solution. What I would like to do is now I would like to show you some nice case studies of uh, using geosynthetics in this particular application. So this is actually Vestal upgrade sections in Melbourne. It's a capping stabilizations with Tensor TX. Uh, it's actually constructed in 2010 and performing very well. There was a finite element modeling was done on this particular project to actually establish the reduction in the paving thickness. And if I remember it correctly, the Conventional design was asking for 500 millimeter of thick capping plus structural fill. It was reduced to 350 millimeter with a layer of geogrids or tensile triaxial geogrids. This is another project, but in this particular case, we are utilizing the geoweb in capping stabilization, similar outcome, reduction in a paving thickness or capping thickness without compromising with the design life of the structure. And in this particular case, it could be possible to reduce the thickness up to 50%. Um, Another steep station pit rehabilitation project. So uh, there was a several mud pumping issues uh, which caused the ballast contamination. They had a major issue with the drainage pipe. 
So the solution was asking for permutation of further mud pumping, improvement of the pala stability, and subsoil drainage. Uh, Geofabrics was involved in this particular project and offered a solution using three different geosynthetic materials, which includes Strectex anti mud pumping geocomposite, Tensor TX190L, and Megaflow for subsoil drain. Uh, and you can see uh, the very clear evident of uh, mud pumping. As you can see, the next, the first photo or major photo is where it, you can see some uh, vegetation occurring in this particular, and you can see very soft upgrade at the same time. Uh, and this is actually current station pit, uh, and we are we are actually monitoring these sections. Uh, the station pit was actually rehabilitated in 2017, and we are keeping an eye on this one. Uh, this is another ballast stabilization with Tensor TX190L. This is one of the mining projects we have been heavily involved, and it is success. Uh, our solution has successfully been accepted by the clients on this particular project. This is another project, but it's a very unique where we are combining the performance of GeoGrid and GeoCell. In this particular case, it's a beams road level crossing in Queensland. We utilize the layer of GeoWeb to reduce the capping layer depth, but at the same time, we also use TrackTex and TX19L to enhance the performance of the ballast layer and actually prevent the mud pumping. So some nice photos, excavations of uh, subgrade conditions, placing the GeoWeb and infilming the capping, installation of track text and installation of TX19L and placing the ballast over the top. Now, what I would like to do is I would like to introduce our green range of the solutions where Geofabrics is now very proud to utilize some recycle polymer materials in our manufacturing process. I will start with Bidim Green. As you know, Bidim is made in Australia. But by utilizing some recycled polymer materials in this particular bidding green, there is no compromise in the performance. It also offers efficient separation and filtration capacities. There is a proven performance. And I can probably say that till today, we actually saved nearly 10,000 bottles of PETs, like Coke bottles and water bottles, going into the landfill by utilizing in our manufacturing process. We recently also introduced Megaflow Green, which is now we can probably say that it's 100% recycled uh, bottle, which is milk bottles. It's also made in Australia. No performance compromisations, efficient drainage capacity, and proven performance. So we are more and more focusing on utilizing recycled polymers in our manufacturing process. The third one is we are taking it to the next level by actually laminating or heat bonding our bidding green material with tensor geogrid. So we can offer the two products together, single installations, easy to install and no compromising with the performance. Last but not least, this is a track tech screen, which we are, we, we are going to introduce very soon into the market. So we are actually replacing two layers of virgin geotextile with a recycled bidding material. So the performance will be the same, microphorous filter will be the same, but we are adding some sort of sustainability in our manufacturing process and replacing that two layers of virgin geotextile with a recycled polymer material. Now, other products and applications in this particular rail application or rail sectors, the first one is definitely rockfall protection system. Uh, and as you can see, McAfee rockfall repair system is well known and well proven uh, project uh, system in Australia. And these are the local case studies or cases where our rockfall netting has been used successfully in this particular projects. Some erosion control issues, which is very common and evident in number of rail sections. So first one is definitely MacMetar. It is in control woven, which is compromised woven mesh turf with a reinforcement matting. The second one is also GeoWeb using for the slope stabilizations. And in this particular case, you can actually use either soil infill or you can utilize span palace. And this is actually one of the project 
of uh, mining applications where GeoWeb was installed on a slope stabilization, but it also allows using stem bars as paint ballast in, as an infill material. And third one is definitely grassroots, which we proudly say manufactured by Geofabrics here in Australia. And we have a number of cases using grassroots as a result of load apply matching uh, on different rail applications. Now, I will introduce you a new product called Concrete Canvas. And I think so you, you may be aware of this particular product, which is utilized for ditch lining. And you can see this is one of the Queensland rail projects where it was used to line the longitudinal uh, um, ditch. Uh, to, this is also another section where it has been used for the transverse lining applications. Some nice photos of the slope protections. And this is one of the projects with the Queensland rail where uh, actually uh, concrete canvas was used as a weed separation. You can use this one for a bond lining also at the same time. And you can see this one is a very nice photos of how concrete canvas was used as a weed separation on one of the projects with the, with the rail industries in Australia. This is actually rail bank slope protection or remediation sections where number of different geosynthetic materials utilized to remediate this particular slope, which includes geotextiles. You can see a Gabion structures there. You can use cellular confinement system in one of the sections. We also use our grassroots as well as concrete canvas in this particular section. So I'm nearly there to finish my presentation. Summary in geosynthetic, so summary on geosynthetics in rail. So geosynthetics can achieve a value engineering and offer a significant cost savings. It also reduces the construction cost. It allows or offers a design flexibility to the clients. It delays the maintenance cycles, lays position times, reduce maintenance cost. And this is one of the very nice photos of a very old projects from Queensland. But it, you can see our tensor or bidding geotextile and tensor was used or installed in this particular project. Main point to be considered is investigations and constructability. I'm finishing here with my presentation. Uh, I, I'm thankful for Engineers Australia to allow me this particular presentation to, for a wider communities. And uh, I'm, I'm here to answer your questions. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you to Mark and Rajesh for those great presentations and insights today. Thank you to everybody as well. We're getting lots of questions coming in through the chat box. Please keep them coming. We've got about 25 minutes um, to go through your questions. Uh, so it's now your turn to get involved. I also want to thank people who sent through questions on uh, um, registration. And don't forget to pop those questions in the chat box. I might start with you, uh, Rajesh. Um, we had a question that's coming from WA, from Alan. Thank you, Alan, and uh, good morning in WA. Ask, how do you estimate the stiffness and strength increase in the soil from using a geoweb slash geogrid for using mechan mechanistic design? Thank you. I think Rajesh is, Rajesh, can you unmute? Thank you. Maybe maybe while uh, Rajesh is just sorting out, sorting out that technical hitch mark, um, we had a question <laughs> that came in around your presentation uh, asking, yes. can this tra track be used for passenger services between Brisbane and Melbourne? connecting regional communities? Uh, great question from uh, Chaminda. Thank you. Yes, yes, Chaminda. Um, I suppose the inland rail network is using some of the existing rail network. And so some of those sections of the rail network um, do have a passenger trains on them. Um, uh, other sections, it will be uh, solely dedicated to freight at the moment, but the, the design is um, being uh, undertaken 
to not to preclude a passenger trains. And one of those things is in Queensland, um, there will be a dual gauge sleepers installed, and so uh, which will facilitate uh, the narrow gauge uh, tr train trains to be utilised on the inland rail uh, network as well. So uh, while it's been designed for freight and will be money used for it, um, it doesn't preclude uh, uh, passenger trains uh, along it. Okay. Thank you for that, Mark. I might just stay with you for a moment and then we'll go back to uh, Rajesh. But I just want to, we've had a question from Yanan who's asked, are there, and we're talking about environmental issues today, but uh, the question is, any specific requirements for recycled materials to be used in inland rail? No, but we haven't precluded recycled materials. I suppose a lot of the alignment for inland rail is is quite remote, and so a lot of the recycled materials that you might find in the urban environment, say recycled concrete, plastics and all that, would actually have to be transported to the inland rail alignment. And so those the opportunities are probably far more limited than if you were building a, a railway network, say, within the urban environment. However, you know, we trying to recycle and reuse um, materials within within the cuts, and so we are utilising those materials as much as possible, because along the alignment, um, in, importing materials from quarries and, and borrow pits uh, incurs uh, a large distances to be travelled, and so that's uh, increased cost. So the specifications has been designed to maximise the use of uh, local material, either uh, from the cuts or from local uh, sources. Thanks, Mark. And Rajesh, welcome back. Um, we uh, might go back to that question we received from Alan in WA. Alan was asking, just reminders, how do you estimate the stiffness and strength in increase in the soil from using a geo-web geogrid for the use in mechanistic design? Thank you, Alan. Uh, thanks, Alan. I hope you can hear me now. Um, yes, I think so. As I present, thank you. As I presented with uh, tensor geogrids uh, using three large scale triaxial testing, that now it is possible to actually define the improvement in the confinement stresses or improvement of the performance of that uh, material with the geogrids uh, without uh, considering any mechanical properties of the geogrids. So that's very a good understanding developed by Tensar, and they also come up with this uh, soil stabilization module called TCCM, uh, T, uh, TSSM, I should say, and that also developed uh, with uh, certain uh, independent, uh, like a softwares like uh, Plexis and Flex, and it's also available from Tensar at no cost involved. Now with GeoWeb. Uh, or GeoCell, I should say, Presto is also developing the solution of using uh, GeoCells in three dimensions or in plexis or like a, any software any software analysis, finite element modeling. So some information are available, Alan, and happy to share that information with you in person. Uh, just uh, I'm, I have your email ID, Alan, so don't worry. I will I will share the details with you as soon as I can. Thank you for that. And Rajesh, following on from this, um, the questions being asked from Manji in New South Wales, do rigid 3D products have any place in providing strength and stability to any temporary or permanent earthworks projects? Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, yes, we have a number of uh, projects and applications with uh, GeoWeb, uh, particularly GeoCell using in uh, load support applications not only in rail but roads port payments heavy duty payments as well as slope stabilization because as you can see the depth of the geo cell is governing the confinement effect of the thickness of the film material in the hindsight if you are using 150 millimeter geo web you are achieving the full confinement zone of 150 millimeter thick film material which generally improves the performance of that field material drastically. So yes, we have a number of case studies and there are proven case studies as well as design guidelines and 
further information available how to actually incorporate a three-dimensional cellular confinement system like Geocell in the design. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, over to you, Mark. Um, we've had a few questions around costs, which we always do. Um, and I think the question that's come in is, um, has the use of geosynthetics been trialled in any other projects before? How significant are the cost savings compared to the traditional approach? And we've had that question asked a couple of different ways, but I think that sums it up best. Mark. Yeah, I suppose um, for the Inland Rail project, um, there's two aspects. There's the brownfield uh, sections, which um, uh, Inland Rail is going through and doing um, works on that to upgrade that track to meet the 30 tonne axle load requirements, but also for the clearances for the for the double stacking. And so there's there's lots of opportunities where the geosynthetics uh, may be and are being used um, to reduce the earthworks in there and the earthworks volumes and the costs. A lot of that is done under possession, so there's limited time and so where you can reduce your earthworks volumes um, by using a geosynthetics, that is a, a advantage. I haven't got any details of cost, uh, cost savings because I'm not part of that. For the main, for the, for the main, for the greenfield sites, um, the geosynthetics uh, um, has been and will be used, uh, mainly in specific areas, and a lot of it is in a, a temporary works. But also, it is um, suitable for use, you know, in in the major earthworks earthwork section. Thanks, Mark. Um, moving on to some of the challenges, um, Jeremy, uh, good afternoon in New South Wales has um, sent through a question directed to you, uh, Rajesh, asking what problems have you observed with installation of geofab grids in rail beds or road pavements, i.e. overlaps, folding on curves or against side ends of subgrade excavations? Rajesh. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, look, Jeremy, uh, um, particularly with uh, the geosynthetic materials uh, we, are, we are talking about here is not that rigid material. They are still flexible. Yeah, so particular geogrid comes in a role. Uh, and majority of the geogrids suppliers and manufacturers have a very good understanding in terms of overlapping and everything. And there is a good guidelines available from Arema or uh, Ash roads as well as ASTO, that what the minimum overlapping is required, which is generally depending on your subgrade condition. So we have some very good uh, installation guidelines available on all the products, but, uh, including geogrids and geocells. And we have a successful case series of utilizing this material here in Australia on a number of infrastructure projects. So particular, as I explained with the geogrids, our first project with the GeoGrid was in 1991, and it has been successfully installed. And uh, particularly with the geo fabric side of the business, uh, we offer uh, assistance to our client uh, by visiting the site and providing a enough confidence on how to pro install the products and do and don'ts, pros and cons. So good information is available. Please contact us and we will provide you further info. Thank you, Rajesh. And just staying with you, uh, Mark, we touched on, we've had quite a few questions on cost. So I just wanted to get your view, Rajesh, what, what, from the geofabrics, what, what is the cost benefit of using the material? Um, uh, thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Look, uh, generally, the main target is whatever I, we have seen here in Australia is reducing the thickness of either capping or structural fill by utilizing one or two layers of geo or multiple layers and different geosynthetic materials. And that's the main cost uh, support you can get. So generally, in majority of the cases, we have seen the installed cost of the geo grids actually much, is much cheaper than the installed cost of the fill material for a certain thicknesses. The other cost effectiveness is utilizing the low quality fill material, which is very easily available. 
And as Mark presented that uh, in the RTC specification, they also allow that one ut utilized a low quality or inferior quality fee material. But at the same time, we also have a target to achieve certain uh, performance out of that layer in terms of strength. So by adding a layer of geosynthetics, it's also allow you to utilize that low quality or inferior carrier, inferior quality fill material. And uh, there are some sound value engineering is available for, for this type of approach. So in terms of our understanding, geosynthetic use always come with a very good cost benefits for the clients. Can I just add something to that? I think um, it, it provides uh, designers with a, additional options um, for their designs, and so and so we can look at the earthworks volumes, materials, and where. And obviously, um, uh, a no design solution that meets all all applications. And so, geotex or just synthetics. Uh, provides an additional tool for the designers uh, to be able to use in s specific locations, and that's that's really what it's all about. Is that um, there's no one size fit all for, for any any engineered solution. Thank you, Mark, for that. Um, Rajesh uh, Kimberly has sent in a question to you, and she's asking. Um, could I please have any innovative treatments? Uh, could I please ask, have any innovative treatments been applied to black soil to reduce capping layer or reuse the material? Thanks, Kimberly. Uh, thanks, Kimberly. Um, yes, uh, um, I still remember some of the projects we have been involved with, uh, in particular Queensland area, uh, with some of the rail authorities where uh, geosynthetic has successfully been used and installed in early or late 90s or early 2000s, I should say, on a black cotton soils, uh, which uh, enhanced the uh, performance of structural fill as well as ballast. So what we are doing is um, we are also putting some science behind it and we, we also taken as a GF, GF fabrics technical team, we have taken uh, a bit parametric study using different geosynthetic materials on a reactive clay. And uh, we are getting some very good results, initial results, that how geosynthetic can be used in uh, a reactive clay side of the subgrade, uh, or sorry, reactive clay side of the applications. Having said, uh, actually, Tensar and Presto geosystems in US uh, came across numerous projects in US, particularly in Texas and some other areas where um, Tensor has truly published some nice uh, case studies as well as uh, full-scale trials on uh, on the reactive clay subgrades. And they are getting a far better and sub results uh, compared with their control sections as well as they also compared uh, with the uh, stabilization, which is lime or cement stabilization. And I still remember Professor Jorge Hornberg presented his outcome maybe two or three years ago to the Australian industry, uh, comparing the use of geosynthetics versus uh, conventional methods like uh, stabilization as well as control method, which is a thicker payment. Uh, as Mark mentions, it's definitely horses for courses, so uh, need to be very careful which layer, uh, which options and methodologies you are selecting, but it has been used. Also, um, geosynthetics can be used for both the temporary works as well as the permanent works. So the permanent works is it's part of the design, but temporary works in black soils, you know, you get some rain and uh, the conditions go all very soft on that. So um, you know, geosynthetics has been used uh, to get uh, con construction equipment back onto the site, uh, placing geosynthetics and a, and a thin layer of, of fill over that. Uh, it gets you up um, out of the bog. Uh, so, so those temporary solutions are just as important as the permanent solutions. Thank you, Mark, for jumping in there. We've had a couple of questions that include uh, Tensar. Um, one of them is, uh, Rajesh, is what is the life durability of the Tensar triax layer 
and if you can just hang on to that thought because we're getting such a lot of questions but around the tensile la uh, layer um, Jabril is asking how would the tensile layer cope with chemical spillage so one was around lifespan and the other around coping with chemical spillage thank you um thanks Amanda so particularly with the live expectancies um the TENSAR have a very good uh, documentation available on uh, triaxial geogrids, what would be the ex expectancy of the life, and it is uh, going up to 40 to 50 years. Uh, I've made it bear in mind, uh, TENSAR triaxial geogrid is made out of polypropylene. So um, now I'm answering the second question, which related to the chemical reactivities. Because it's made out of polypropylene, it have a very high resistance against uh, pH high or low pH value and as we know majority of the chemical containers are made out of either polypropylene or high density polyethylene so it have a very high resistance against any uh, environmental impact or chemical chemical reactivity thank you for that and over to Victoria and to Martin. Uh, good afternoon, Martin. Martin's asking you, Rajesh, how efficient are geofabric materials in minimizing mud holes? Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, Martin, uh, we introduced Tractex uh, only nearly five or six years now, and we have a numerous case studies throughout Australia. Uh, to actually um, make it possible that uh, Tractex is preventing a mud pumping in rail industries. And there are numerous case studies we have throughout Australia, which is successful until it preventing mud pumping happening to in these particular sections. And uh, as I presented in my presentation that uh, the Geofabrics UK actually invented these products in early 2000s and they, it was actually backed up with a very good uh, trials and testing done. At the same time, the first full-scale trial was done on this particular product in UK in 2011, if I remember it correctly. There are so many case studies, uh, successful case studies and, and projects we have here in Australia where uh, Tectex has been used and still it has been used uh, by certain real authorities in Australia. Thank you. We had a great question uh, come in uh, from Tech Chow uh, in Asia asking, um, directed to Rajesh, but asking um, to our speakers, is there good potential for maglev in replacing conventional rails for medium or long haul travel? Rajesh, you might want to kick off. Um, I I think so. I will leave it for Mark because uh, he, he might give you a better understanding than myself. So um, I prefer to uh, pass it on to Mark, please. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see Maglev uh, network all around Australia. Uh, being on the, I actually went on the Shanghai Maglev uh, quite a few years ago and it was a fantastic um, experience. I suppose with the maglev and, and these high-speed trains, they need very good uh, structure uh, underneath them because they're travelling at, at such speeds, and so those those require very rigid rigid foundations and that. So um, uh, I think the cost in, um, the cost of those um, types of systems, you know, within Australia is um, uh, that. Um, isn't um, economical at the moment. You know, we just don't have the population or the or the or the budget to, to sort of do those. But yeah, I'd love to see a maglev go from um, Melbourne to Brisbane in probably four hours or five hours or something like that. So it'd be pretty good. It'd certainly um, a beat going on a plane. Sounds good. Any travel sounds good right now. Just um We've had a great question come in from Minilab, who's asking um, whoever wants to pick up, pick this up. What would you recommend for slope stabilisation methods for and soil in areas with heavy monsoon, exposed to continuous landslide and erosion? Great question. 
Mark, would you Josh? like to go first or Mark? Oh, sure. Uh... Yeah, well, I suppose you know, like engineering any engineering design of slopes is always a challenge, and you've got and you've got lots of different tools that you can and and levers that you can use as a designer. You know, obviously uh, within uh, high rainfall areas. Um, erosion protection and the durability of the, of the material is is important, and um, you know, laying back batters is is probably the first thing that you can do. Have a flatter batters and and having benches that that capture those materials. But if you if you haven't got um, the ability to flatten the batters, well then you have to have steep. Well then you need to protect it. And so you know there's a whole range of different products ranging from the geotextiles all the way through to shotcrete and uh, panelling and all that. And so, like everything, um, it's it's re-dependent on the situation and the and the cost uh, the, the cost um, of of the project. Over to you, Rajesh. Um, thank, thanks, Mark. I think so you summarised very well. So in terms of design and everything, it's possible. Uh, in terms of solutions, as Mark mentioned, there are numerous different options using or utilizing different geosynthetic materials. And that, that geosynthetic material also allows, as Mark mentioned, to have a, like a gentle slope of one to one to actually making it up to 90 degrees. So there are different options available using geosynthetic materials. And then if you are going with a typical slopes applications, you can actually protect the skin or surface by using different geosynthetic solution too, which covers, which actually covers biodegradable material uh, to the geosynthetic solutions or permanent geosynthetic solution, I should say, uh, which is wide range of the different options and systems available. Thank you. Thank you. And we are running out of time, but I, I just wanted to pick up, I'm going to shorten Martin, who's in New Zealand. I want to shorten your question a little bit. Um, but he's at, Martin's asked the question, will the inland route be electrified? And I want to leave it at that. So, Mark, do you want to comment on that? Um, at the moment, the train plan is for diesel trains, so um, 1,800 metre long um, freight trains. So they'll have um, two locomotives uh, normally at the front um, with um, the amount of carriages. And so, no, it's not planned to be electrified. Um, it doesn't preclude it, um, but at the moment, no, it's not. Thanks, Mark. And Rajesh, um, we've moved on to noise emissions and Shiraz in New South Wales has asked us, can you please elaborate some key innovative ways and means to reduce noise emissions from rail operations, particularly in urban settings? Great question, Shiraz. Yeah, uh, look, it's a, it's a good question. And uh, recently we have seen some usage of uh, like a ballast mat types of the system utilized in uh, urban development, particular on uh, concrete slabs. Uh, and that is actually that particular alasmet used for two things. One is definitely vibration. And second one is uh, uh, noise cancelling up to a certain extent. So there are systems or geosynthetic materials available uh, for noise cancellations and vibrations in uh, urban developments. Just to add Thank to you. that, um, there's been yes. a whole lot of recent research done by University of Wollongong and now the University of New South Wales on using rubber inclusions and recycled rubber within within the ballast layers. And then that reduces the noise and the vibration. So um, replacing some of the, the hard rock ballast with some with some rubber inclusions. But um, yeah, there's lots of other different, different um, opportunities as well to reduce noise. Thanks, Mark. And we might have to make this our final question, but it's coming from Danielle, who's in Tasmania, asking, is there available on the market a geofabric which could have high gripping capability to cohesive soils? And maybe from that question is, what in the next few years, what do you see is the, the future of 
what will be occurring in this space going forward, the key things. So back to Dian Danielle's question, uh, gripping capability to cohesive soils. Rajesh. <laughs> Good question. Uh, particular uh, geosynthetic has been used uh, with a cohesive soil. I think so the main main issue or main consideration is actually interface friction angle uh, between this cohesive soil and different geosynthetic materials. So if you are using like an open structure like uh, geogrids, it will give you far better um, friction resistance compared to the geotextile. But it also depends on the surface of the geotextiles, how smooth it is, is it a rough, and then you can actually developed a very good understanding between the uh, friction properties of uh, clay material and the geogrades or geosynthetic materials. So in majority of the cases, uh, people carry out the uh, uh, shear box testing to make this, uh, to come up with some numbers. Uh, in terms of design guidelines, I think of so BS8006, Australian standard AS4, AS57, AS, uh, sorry, uh, S4678 uh, define this type of information very well, um, but the high gripping capabilities. Uh, it's, uh, generally, we have seen with the geogrid types of the application, the reduction factor for the friction properties of the material will be much lower. With clay material, it could go up to 0. 0.6 or 0. 0.7. Thank you. Uh, Mark, do you want to bring us home and close on what do you think are the big changes that we're going to see um, in the next few years? Yeah, I think all projects are being challenged uh, technically and economically and so uh, the use of geosynthetics is quite um, advantageous, especially when geosynthetics are produced from recycled materials and um, a lot of projects are looking for uh, green star ratings or ISCA ratings and all that and so using those products that use recycled materials um, it, um, pr provides additional advantages and um, and yeah so any any project that um, you know, has large earthworks volumes with limited materials um, just synthetics is uh, will be will be part of that uh, part of the, the design options and I think that it that will increase um, uh, rather than decrease over time. And I suppose also as we get a better understanding of the design and the outcomes and the long-term performance, uh, that will increase uh, the, um, the the use of in innovative technologies. Rajesh. Thanks, Avinda. I think so. I just uh, I will follow my Mark's comments, uh, particularly with uh, geosynthetics and uh, utilizing geosynthetics in uh, earthworks and rail industries. Uh, so we have seen uh, successful case studies or case histories uh, in Australia using uh, geosynthetic materials to reduce the overall construction cost, timing, reducing the thickness of the fill material. But at the same time, now we are taking it to the next level by as a local manufacturer of geosynthetic materials or largest geosynthetic manufacturers here in Australia. We started using uh, sourcing recycled polymers from Australia and utilizing in our manufacturing process to offer these additional sustainable products uh, to the infrastructure industries here in Australia. Uh, the thing is we are local here, which means uh, applying some of the geosynthetic materials is very quick uh, turnaround instead of getting or sourcing it overseas. And as you, I'm pretty sure number of uh, like a manuf manufacturers as well as distributors are experiencing these issues with uh, getting the material from overseas because of the freight and some other issues. Uh, we are generally provide that particular support and assistance to the client by having a local manufacturing uh, systems and everything here. And uh, by having this uh, three dimensional, like a sorry, tri shell testing and coming up with some innovative solutions to be used in uh, finite element modeling and different sophisticated softwares. Uh, this also allows utilizing more geosynthetic materials uh, for the infrastructure projects. 
Thank you, Ritesh. Uh, well, that is absolutely all we have time for today. And please join me once again in thanking Mark and Rajesh for their time and insights shared at today's session. We really appreciate it. Um, I'd also like to thank Engineers Australia's uh, industry partner, Geofabrics, for making this afternoon's webinar possible. As always, we appreciate your feedback. If you could put forward, uh, please complete a short feedback form, which is linked in the description box below. Um, on behalf of Engineers Australia, thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you at our next Thought Leaders webinar. Thank you and good afternoon.